Um, and remember, the Israelis have been always looking, always on the lookout, searching for collaborating Palestinians, and uh, they found a good number since the 1920s. However, they, they were... The Electronic Intifada. The Electronic Intifada. The Electronic Intifada. This is the Electronic Intifada podcast. I'm Nora Barrows Friedman. And I'm Asa Win Stanley. Welcome back to the Electronic Intifada podcast. Uh, my name is Tamara Nassar. I am subbing for my colleague, Nora Barris friedman and this is Asa Win Stanley. We are delighted to welcome our very special guest today, Joseph Masad. Uh, Professor Masad teaches modern Arab politics and intellectual history at Columbia University in New York City. He is the author of several books, including Desiring Arabs and Islam and Liberalism. He is also one of the leading uh, Palestinian intellectuals of our time. Uh, Professor Masad, thank you for joining us back on the show. It's a pleasure to be back. Yeah, thank you, thanks Tamara, for, for having me. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we know you're very busy and uh, it's a real privilege for us to have you back on the show again. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure, Asa. Thank you. So the Palestinian Authority has been in the news since the horrific murder of a uh, prominent Palestinian dissident uh, in the custody of its security forces on uh, June 24th earlier this year. And uh, the killing of Banat and uh, the PA's subsequent attacks, arrests, uh, beatings of demonstrators protesting his killing have exposed more than ever the purpose of uh, the PA's existence fundamentally as, uh, as Israel's collaborator. So, Today's discussion will give a brief overview of what these past few months have revealed about the Palestinian Authority and its origins, but uh, it, will also, uh, it will also give an overview of the position that the PA uh, occupies today. So in a recent Middle East Eye piece in June, uh, you described the Palestinian Authority as a collaborating body with the Israeli apartheid regime under US sponsorship. Could you please start by explaining how the PA acts for Israel and not for the Palestinians? Well, I've been describing the uh, Palestinian Authority as a collaborating authority ever since its inception uh, back in 1994 when it took over power after the PLO um, uh, signed the Oslo Agreement in September 1993 around um, uh, 28 years uh, uh, this week, uh, 28 years ago. So um, I think you know, that the PA was uh, created precisely as a collaborating body uh, through the Oslo uh, mechanism. Um, and remember the Israelis had been always looking, always on the lookout, searching for collaborating Palestinians. And uh, they found a good number since the 1920s. However, they, they were unable and were unsuccessful in finding Palestinians with much national legitimacy to collaborate with them. Um, ever since the PLO was created uh, in, the, in 1964 and subsequently in, since 1969 when the guerrilla groups took over uh, the PLO and uh, it began to represent the effort of Palestinians to resist and combat Israeli colonialism, uh, the Israelis began to look uh, very seriously for an alternative to the PLO. This became more pressing in the early 1970s, early to mid 1970s, as the PLO began to get international recognition. In 1973, it received recognition from the non-aligned movement. In 1974, it received it from both the League of Arab States as well as the United nations. Uh, therefore, the Israelis were uh, most concerned about the ascending international legitimacy of the Palestinian cause as represented by the guerrilla dominated uh, PLO. Um, they had, uh, you know, they, they went through a, a number of strategies, one of which was 
um, having uh, mayoral elections in the West Bank and Gaza, uh, initially successful um, in 1972. They brought about uh, mayors that were loyalists to the Hashemite regime in Jordan, which had been on very good terms with the Israelis and with the Zionists since the 1920s, uh, and therefore uh, um, tried to or hoped that they could um, in fact, uh, uh, stand in for Palestinian interests rather than the PLO, especially as their political position would not have been inimical to that of Israel, but rather uh, uh, cooperative. It didn't work. By 1976, the entire slate of mayors that were elected were elected on a PLO uh, uh, platform, and the, sort of the elections backfired on Israel, who had at the time hoped to uh, project a kind of image of a benign uh, military occupation um, of the West Bank and Gaza. Um, they tried again uh, with, with the failure of the mayoral and municipal elections. They tried with something they called the village leagues in 1978, which also fell through in the early 80s, as most of the participants in the village league project were immediately identified as collaborators and traitors by the PLO and were threatened. Um, if they were to participate in that body. Uh, so um, uh, all these uh, attempts had failed, and, and, and we can speak perhaps later on the history of earlier attempts to uh, uh, co-opt uh, uh, Palestinian leaders. The Israelis decided in the 1980s, they went back to the Jordan option, um, which had been given up by King Hussein in the middle of the 1970s, uh, not out of you know, his own will, but as a result of the will of the League of Arab States, which chose at the time to recognize the PLO as the sole legitimate representative of the Palestinians. Nonetheless, after the Israeli invasion of Lebanon and the defeat of the PLO and its exile, and certainly after it was um, uh, fragmented in 1983 through a kind of a civil war uh, between the different factions of the PLO, the Jordanians decided in the middle, middle of the 1980s to perhaps uh, uh, extend a, a, a rope to save it from drowning uh, by allowing it to hold a, a PNC uh, meeting in Amman when other countries in the Arab world had refused. Uh, but this was in preparation for some kind of final uh, uh, what was called at the time pragmatic position that the PLO would adopt. Um, things accelerated quickly. Uh, finally, the Jordan option was no longer available in 1987 with the Palestinian uprising uh, engulfing the occupied territories. The Jordanian uh, regime decided to uh, delink itself uh, from the West Bank. Um, uh, and the Israelis now were in a bind that uh, the Jordanian regime, which had uh, historically spoken for the Palestinians, uh, were now delinking. Um, the saving grace of this entire story was, of course, the Gulf War um, and the penalties uh, that accumulated against the PLO uh, as a result in terms of funding by Gulf governments, which stopped. Uh, Iraq stopped funding because it was now under siege. Uh, this was coupled with a major uh, failure uh, internationally in terms of its diplomatic stature with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc. So the PLO was finally exactly where Israel had always hoped it would be. Without funds, without diplomatic backing, um, it could now bend in any possible way that the Israelis uh, uh, would want it to. And indeed, it did. So this is the time when... Uh, even though in 91, they were not really sure, and they still brought in the Jordanians to speak for the Palestinians at the uh, Madrid conference. I mean, they brought in a Palestinian delegation under the rubric of the Jordanian delegation, but secretly they were basically hammering out a deal to make sure the PLO surrendered uh, uh, completely on all the principles for which it had stood um, uh, since uh, uh, the middle of the 1960s and certainly since 1969, which it obliged uh, at Oslo. So uh, the PLO in that sense was transformed through the mechanism of Oslo from the liberation movement to uh, uh, a movement or uh, an organization that uh, would help enforce uh, the occupation that uh, with which uh, the Israelis uh, um, uh, in a way subcontracted a Jewish settler colonialism um, uh, in the occupied uh, territories. 
This was very important, of course, for the Israelis, a great achievement because the PLO had a huge amount of legitimacy prior to 1993 as a representative of the Palestinians. And therefore, rather than find a counter uh, organization to the PLO, which they had tried to do, which always lacked that kind of legitimacy, they hoped and perhaps correctly uh, to a certain extent, that the legitimacy of the period of struggle uh, that the PLO had acquired uh, would uh, uh, sort of have a, a large momentum that would carry it through its collaborationist future in a way. And to a certain extent, that's exactly sort of how things unfolded, but very, very quickly, of course, um, uh, the PLO gave way to the Palestinian Authority, which uh, Oslo insisted uh, on it as a body to be created and to be the future negotiator with Israel on whatever deal uh, they would broker. The PLO as a representative of all Palestinians was relegated to the background. The PA came to uh, speak for the Palestinians of the occupied territories minus East Jerusalem, of course, not the diaspora, not the refugees, and certainly not Palestinians inside Israel. So in one stroke, not only did the PLO become a collaborating body, um, it ceased to, uh, in, in doing so, it contracted the Palestinian people by two thirds, meaning it gave up its representative capacity for all Palestinians and claimed now, as Israel had been doing for decades, that the Palestinian people are only those who live in the West Bank and Gaza, and therefore they're the only ones that Israel would be concerned with um, in terms of any possible deal in the future. Um, and uh, the budget and the money that used to go into the coffers of the PLO were now dry and they were transferred to the PA. So uh, uh, as a result, uh, definitionally, the Palestinian Authority was created as a collaborationist body to help enforce the occupation. Um, it was created uh, through the Cairo Agreement or rather its police force was created through the Cairo agreement and the responsibilities for its police force was precisely to safeguard a Jewish colonial settlers in the occupied territories in Gaza and the West Bank and to uh, prevent all acts of Palestinian resistance against the Israeli occupation, and most importantly, to demobilize Palestinian society, which had been highly mobilized since December 1987, after the eruption of the Palestinian revolt known as the First Intifada. Um, so it quickly moved to perform all these tasks with aplomb, I would say. Mm. So uh, you've talked a little bit there about earlier in what you were saying about the village leagues, the failure yes. of, the, of the village leagues as a kind of precursor in a way to the Palestinian Authority as a collaborationist entity in the West Bank. Um, could you talk about earlier efforts by Israel and the Zionist movement before 1948 to recruit Palestinian collaborators? Indeed. Um, I think, you know, the effort was uh, really a, a, an important one, and it begins as soon as the British occupation of Palestine begins in December, or late November, early, early December 1917. Um, by August 1918, much of Mandate Palestine was under British occupation. The Zionist executive, which was set up to represent uh, uh, the colonial settler Jewish population in Palestine, uh, began to pay closer attention to uh, the question of co-opting uh, Palestinian leaders or Palestinians whom uh, the Zionists would make into leaders to speak for the Palestinians. One of the important uh, uh, responses that Palestinians had uh, after the British occupation, and they continued their ongoing resistance to Jewish settler colonialism that had begun in the 1880s, was the creation of Muslim Christian associations. Um, they had to do this because the British set up a sectarian system as soon as they came in. They insisted on Palestine being divided among its different uh, 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 religious sects, uh, uh, meaning uh, Muslims, Christians, and Jews. Uh, there was a very tiny community of uh, uh, Jews who had been in Palestine since the uh, 16th century. Um, they uh, 
numbered about 4,000 in the middle of the 19th century. There were probably about um, 10,000 at that time, but there was of course a growing body of Jewish colonial settlers who now seem to be, have amalgamated according to the British in Palestinian society that they constituted a separate almost indigenous sect rather than a colonial settler uh, sect. In that sense, what the British were doing in Palestine in the early 20s is not unlike what the Americans tried to do in Iraq after the occupation of segmenting it along ethnic or religious lines. However, Sunni in doing Shia, so, so Sunni, so. Shia, and, and it's, it's more complicated in Iraq because they did it religiously in terms of Sunni and Shia, and then they did the Kurdish uh, versus Arab, although it was just like there's Kurdish parties and the Arabs were divided into, into Sunni and Shiites. This way, the Iraqi people now became three different segments um, uh, in the name of American style uh, 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 democracy, if you will. So uh, the British had done something very similar. To counter that, early on, Palestinian Muslims and Christians immediately set up a Muslim Christian associations, first of all, to gain legitimacy in the new sectarian system that the British had established, and at the same time to show unity of purpose and of political goals in fighting the Balfour Declaration, British occupation, as well as the facilitation of Jewish settler colonialism, which the British occupation and mandate um, promised uh, uh, to sponsor, uh, and were indeed uh, already sponsoring. So as a result, um, uh, the uh, Zionist executive was very concerned about the solidarity among Palestinian Christians and Muslims and began to work to undermine this uh, uh, show of communal solidarity among Palestinian Christians and Muslims. So they began to sponsor and finance Muslim national associations that excluded Christians with local collaborators. Um, this would become very, a very important effort. It would be, uh, they would choose several Palestinians uh, to collaborate with them on uh, the Muslim national uh, associations. And uh, one of them, of course, was uh, a collaborator, a Palestinian mayor of Haifa by the name of Hassan Shukri, who was already in office since 1914 by the Ottomans uh, and who in 1921 thanked the British in a letter for issuing the Balfour Declaration and continued to collaborate <laughs> with them until his death in 1940. Um, he, there were several assassination attempts on him in the 1930s that were unsuccessful. He died of natural causes in 1940 and remains a hero, a hero collaborator for Zionism and Israel who uh, celebrate, uh, uh, continue to celebrate them to this day. Um, so uh, there were others, of course, who were involved in this project. Uh, the Hayim Kalvariski, one of the most important Zionist colonial officials who was also in charge of the so-called Arab department in the Zionist executive that uh, uh, represented the colonial settler community in Palestine, was the one in charge of co-opting uh, Palestinians uh, to put them on the pay uh, on the payroll of the Zionist executive and to advance uh, uh, the agenda of Zionism, that Zionism was not a threat to the Palestinians at all, that they would improve uh, uh, Palestinian lives and that they should be uh, uh, viewed as friends and not as colonial conquerors, for example. Um, uh, indeed, uh, 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 someone like Hassan Shukri would later uh, insist on adding Hebrew to official uh, uh, bureaucratic paperwork in the Haifa municipality in the 1930s, uh, despite the fact that the Arabic was always the uh, official language and uh, uh, all the native population uh, of Haifa uh, uh, spoke Arabic as their native language, regardless of if, if they were uh, uh, Jewish, even the small Jewish community who spoke Arabic versus the colonial settlers, of course, who did not. So that's one aspect of this. They even set up uh, with the help of uh, a major Jerusalemite family, uh, the Neshashibi family or its leaders, who were uh, in opposition to another Palestinian Jerusalem family that the British uh, uh, also appointed to high uh, uh, office. They played both families against one another, but the Neshashibis would not only collaborate with the British, but especially with the Zionists, even in creating what was called then peasant parties or sometimes farmer parties that allegedly were organized by the Zionists against Palestinian landlords. Although of course it was Palestinian big landlords who set them up as a front 
for uh, uh, Zionist interests. They were small, they did not have much following. It's not unlike what you have in all other colonial situations where the colonizing power sets up bodies of collaborators and tries to infiltrate uh, all uh, resistance uh, against the colonial project. Um, so the, the, you know, the Muslim national associations were of course meant to alienate Palestinian Christians that Muslims were having their own associations. Um, and slowly the British would only recognize uh, a lot of these religious organizations separately. They would set up something called the Islamic, uh, the Supreme Islamic Council uh, for uh, 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 Palestinian Muslims. Palestinian Christians divided into a number of denominations, the largest of which, of course, is the Eastern Orthodox Palestinian Christians, set up their own organizations that were in alliance with the Muslim organizations, but now were separate because the British demanded that even municipal elections be uh, uh, divided uh, uh, along sectarian lines. So the kind of sectarianism that the British and the Zionists introduced into Palestine was the main venue through which they had hoped collaboration with the colonizers uh, would be most effective. Uh, to a certain extent, they did create uh, some uh, uh, sectarian divisions in the late 1920s and early 1930s, especially as the British would allow a major evangelical Protestant uh, 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 world uh, or you know, a, a conference to take place in Jerusalem um, at that time, uh, sponsored mostly by the uh, uh, British founded YMCA, but sponsored by its American branches at the time, in the hope of uh, sort of making Jerusalem a center for evangelical Christianity. Uh, most Palestinian Christians, especially the Orthodox, whose uh, uh, laity had been uh, targeted by Protestant evangelicals to be converted to their religion, immediately opposed the conference, as did other Muslims. But of course, there was all kinds of sectarian propaganda put forth that the evangelicals might have been supported by Palestinian Christians, uh, which of course they were not. And indeed, uh, all the major bodies uh, of Palestinian, representative bodies of Palestinian Muslims and Christians came together to condemn the conference and condemn the sectarian uh, 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 sort of campaign that uh, ensued. Uh, after the Palestinian uh, revolt uh, began initially in 1935, with the guerrilla groups under Azadine al Qassam. And subsequently, uh, when the strike began uh, uh, in 1936, with the revolt becoming increasingly uh, uh, widespread across the country and British repression becoming more and more draconian, um, the British and the Zionists were able to fund and train uh, a number of Palestinian collaborators, some of whom had been actually part of the Palestinian revolt, but were co-opted by the British representative in Damascus at the time, uh, sent back to Palestine to lead what was then called the peace bands, or what Palestinian nationalists would refer to as the peace gangs, who began to target the Palestinian revolutionaries and shoot them. And they were, of course, on the pay on the payroll of the Zionists, um, and the British had helped train them. Uh, ultimately, uh, two of the major leaders of the peace bands, uh, Fakhri Nashashibi and Fakhri Abdel Hadi, would be assassinated um, in 1941 and 1943 uh, by Palestinian loyalists uh, for their collaboration. Uh, they did not, of course, command a, a large following, but they uh, clearly were able to inflict some uh, uh, harm on the Palestinian uh, revolution. Um, after 1948, Palestinians living inside Israel were subjected, those who were not expelled, the remaining Palestinians who uh, were uh, managed to not to be expelled uh, uh, inside Israel. Also, uh, their leaders were being co-opted, especially village Bukhtars or the village elders, uh, uh, kind of a, uh, mayors, uh, who, through whom the Israelis tried to impose their apartheid policies, uh, the past laws that they imposed on Palestinian citizens of Israel from 1948 to 1966 which was extended actually to 67 before it was finally removed. All of that happened through the Mukhtars and some other sort of uh, 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 collaborating Palestinians, um, and which takes us uh, to the occupied territories after 1967, um, where, as I mentioned earlier, the municipal elections would be the 
uh, sort of major venue of the early 70s, moving to the Village League in the late 70s. So um, the Israelis had, or the Zionists had never tired of finding uh, Palestinians who would collaborate with them. The problem with all these attempts, as I was uh, saying earlier, is that few of these collaborators had ever had any legitimacy in the eyes of the majority of the Palestinian people. And no national representative body um, ever collaborated in this sense, or the Israelis were unable to co-opt them um, until they co-opted uh, the PLO and transformed it into the PA uh, in the early 1990s. So those first years when the Palestinian Authority was founded out of a transition from the Palestine Liberation Organization, what did they look like on the ground? And can you think of other comparable examples in history of a liberation movement going over to the side of oppressor? Um, well, I mean, the, at the beginning of uh, uh, the PA rule or, or Oslo, like I said earlier, the Cairo Agreement uh, and subsequently the Washington uh, signing of it or ratification of it created the bodies of Palestinian security uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, core that would be used to uh, repress the Palestinians uh, and to prevent uh, any resistance to them. I've, I've written several times uh, on the earliest uh, of incidents when three uh, Fatah militias uh, shot uh, uh, this guy who refused to remove his car after he parked it in a place where they did not like in Gaza, they shot him uh, in the legs. Uh, a few weeks later when Arafat arrived in Gaza and there was demonstrations by students against Oslo, his police force killed between 13 or 14 uh, Palestinian students, uh, something which for which he was commended by then Vice President Al Gore, who uh, uh, was happy with Arafat setting up military tribunals for those who opposed Oslo, which of course were depicted as terrorists or extremists who are anti-peace rather than anti-collaboration and anti-surrender. Uh, uh, so uh, that security uh, body that was of course subsequently trained by the Americans and funded by the Americans and the EU over the years, initially it began as, uh, uh, its, its mandate was its responsibility for internal security and for public order, meaning to prevent Palestinian resistance and to also protect Jewish colonial settlers, not in their settlements because they could not go there, but if they decide to go through Palestinian towns, whether shopping or to harass uh, the indigenous Palestinians. So initially there was about 9,000 policemen, 7,000 of whom were brought in with the PLO from abroad, from exile. Um, so these were clearly uh, Palestinian guerrillas who were transformed through the mechanism of Oslo into mercenaries, right? This would be the birth certificate of uh, uh, the Palestinian uh, uh, security force. Uh, but with, with regards to um, uh, the question of precedence uh, in other places, I mean, I think there's probably one prominent uh, uh, precedent, which is UNITA, uh, which was the one of the liberation movements in Angola. Uh, it was one of two major uh, liberation movements. There was the MPLA and UNITA. UNITA had been funded and supported by the Chinese uh, from the middle of the 1960s or late 60s up to 1975 uh, or 76. Upon the liberation of Angola, UNITA switched sides rather than from fighting the Portuguese for the liberation of Angola as the MPLA. PLA uh, took over the country after it uh, after independence. UNITA uh, began to receive funding and training by apartheid South Africa and the US to undermine the revolution and the new independent country of Angola. And in that sense, began to, uh, but not only began, launched an actual war uh, um, and raids uh, uh, on uh, Angola uh, uh, with South Africa's uh, uh, apartheid backing at the time. So, um, you know, and, and of course, uh, Angola was a settler colony as well. Most of the Portuguese settler colonists left after the end of uh, 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 Portuguese settler colonialism, but there had always been interest in Angola uh, by uh, South Africa, who had already been in occupation of Namibia, which was another white colonial settlement bordering Angola. So uh, in that sense, uh, 
perhaps not as egregious as what the PLO did. But remember, most uh, uh, national, or not most, a large number of liberation groups uh, who after, you know, after they won independence in normal colonies, not in settler colonies, would come to uh, serve as allies of the former colonial power after they come to, uh, after they come to power. And the, the neo destour of uh, Tunisia, for example, which would become, of course, an ally of France. And there are many, many examples. And Tunisia also had been a French settler colony, not as large as uh, uh, France, not as large as the Italian settler colony of Libya, but nonetheless a settler colony. And, uh, but you still saw this kind of collaboration by uh, kind of a nationalist movement that was not committed necessarily to a revolutionary program, but rather to more of a garden variety, uh, titular uh, national independence from formal colonialism rather than an, you know, any kind of economic independence, which it did not call for. Um. I want to bring it up to the present day a little bit and how the Palestinian Authority is perceived in the West. And by uh, by that, I don't mean so much the Western governments, but I actually mean even the Palestine Solidarity Movement in uh, Europe and uh, and uh, North America. Um, so why do why do some people in the Palestine Solidarity Movement view the PA as, quote unquote, the government of Palestine? Um, I can give one example of this recently that happened in Britain, which was uh, there was a, a solidarity event called the Big Ride for Palestine, which was a kind of sponsored bike ride um, to raise funds. Uh, it was organized by the Palestine Solidarity Campaign. But at its final rally, it hosted the PA's London ambassador, Hassan Zomlot, as its star speaker. So, you know, and, and it's just one of many examples of some Zomla often attends Palestine solidarity demonstrations in, uh, in London and so forth. And his predecessor was the same. Um, and he was welcomed by the PA, but by the um, PSC. So, I mean, and, and you, uh, one comparison people often make uh, with, of the PA in terms of the South Africa example would be, the Bantu stands, the sort of collaborationist entities under the South African apartheid regime. So there's some similarities there with the PA, but you can't imagine the um, anti-apartheid movement in the 70s or 80s welcoming Bantu stand leaders to London. So like, why do you think the true nature of the PA is not more widely understood in these areas? And why is it not viewed in a similar way to the Bantu stand leaders? Well, I mean, um, several things. Remember that the PLO, again, this was the reason why the Israelis thought the best thing to do instead of finding an anti-PLO Palestinian collaborating leadership, why not transform the PLO itself into an anti-PLO collaborations leadership? Because this way we could bank on its historic legitimacy. And indeed, remember the PLO in the 60s and 70s and 80s was seen as not unlike all these other liberation movements from settler colonialism, whether it's the ANC, whether it was SWAPO in Namibia, Frelimo in Mozambique, the MPLA in Angola, etc. So it was seen as, or you know, ZANU and ZAPU in, in Rhodesia. So the, 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 there's a great uh, sort of reputation that these revolutionary groups had because of the struggle that they had uh, engaged in to liberate their peoples from settler colonialism. This was a, you know, this was part of the big reputation that the PLO had. Subsequently, after Oslo, the liberal propaganda uh, insisted that what the PLO had done was basically a peace deal uh, with Israel, where and allegedly we were told there was mutual recognition. Of course, there was no such thing at Oslo. At Oslo, the PLO recognized Israel's right to exist as a Jewish settler colony on the land of the Palestinians. In return, the Israelis only recognized the PLO as the legitimate representative of the Palestinian people. They did not recognize the Palestinian people's right to uh, their homeland or a state uh, or anything of the sort. So it was not really mutual recognition. But US and European propaganda, as well as Arab uh, uh, official uh, regime propaganda, uh, began to put forth this idea that the PLO had not really changed. It was the same PLO and not a different one. People would begin to wake up to this uh, 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 perhaps after 2006 uh, with, with uh, Hamas elections uh, that defeated Fatah. But by then, Islamophobia had been institutionalized uh, much more so than ever before after 9-11. And therefore, 
the PLO or the PA maintained that it was the, still the legitimate Palestinian representative. The difference between the Bantustans and uh, 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 the ANC versus the PLO is that when the Bantustans existed, when the Inkatha movement or people like Butalezi were collaborating with apartheid South Africa, they were countered by the ANC, by Oliver Tambo, by Nelson Mandela's uh, uh, reputation, even when he was imprisoned, um, uh, which is exactly what happened when the village leagues were put about. The PLO was there to counter the village leagues. The PLO was there to counter the uh, 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 sort of uh, pro Hashemite uh, mayors of the early 70s who had been uh, uh, elected in 1972. Um, and therefore, this under undermined them. But by the time the PLO itself became, became uh, 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 the Inkatha uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, movement, if you will, or uh, maybe to be uh, uh, more precise, when Arafat uh, was transformed from Nelson Mandela into Abu Talezi, there was no counter to him. Um, so as a result, uh, 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 it gave legitimacy to the Bantustan project. Imagine if Nelson Mandela was the one who would agree to have presided over something like the Bantustans. Right. Uh, so uh, there was a lot of that, I think, that, that went into uh, people's perceptions of what the PA was. There was a lot less uh, room for uh, the Palestinian opposition to, to Oslo to be broadcast in uh, the international Western dominated media. Um, uh, perhaps there was a lot more of that in the Arab media, but less so in the international media. I remember I, my first article against Oslo was in an academic journal, not in a journalistic uh, mode, um, which I submitted, say, in, in October of 1993. It came out in early 94 because uh, uh, it was a journal. It, takes, it, it took more time to be published. Uh, but it would have been very, very difficult for me to have found uh, 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 newspaper outlets where I could express these views in the, in the sort of radical rejection of the premise of Oslo, which my article at the time had expressed. Similarly, um, uh, when Edward Said opposed Oslo uh, immediately after the deal, the only place that would publish his uh, 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 rejection was a kind of a, you know, a, a, a liberal Zionist a newspaper where he had published before, which is The Nation magazine uh, uh, in London, but, but, but in, in New York, but he was also publishing in the Arabic press in London and in the uh, Egyptian uh, Al-Ahram Weekly, where he expressed mm -hmm. also uh, his views on these questions. And indeed, um, most of his articles that were critical of the Palestinians, uh, if you want the long version, uh, you should read them in Al-Ahram Weekly or in Al-Hayat in Arabic, and the much more highly uh, 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 perhaps censored and shortened version uh, would come out in the Nation magazine at that time. Uh, and I'm not really sure how many of his articles they might have rejected and how many they accepted, but that was the only venue, I, if I, as I recall, where he published his early criticisms um, the Palestinian uh, Versailles called it, right? The Palestinian Versailles, yes. I, I, I actually was critical of that uh, uh, analogy I, I, in writing when I, when I wrote, and I discussed this with uh, Said at the time, because I thought uh, uh, the Palestinian, that, that Versailles was imposed on a Germany that began the war. The Palestinians never began the war. So yes, the effect um, of the, the humiliation of Germany after the war through Versailles might have been similar to the humiliation of the Palestinians. But of course, uh, a, a, a more apt analogy I always thought was the kinds of deals that were imposed on the ruler of Tunisia by France in the 1880s to welcome French occupation um, into his country, uh, um, you know, as a more appropriate example, or uh, hmm. the, the pressure on uh, Egypt and the co-optation of the rulers of Egypt in the early 1880s, and the, which facilitated the British invasion and occupation um, of uh, uh, Egypt, uh, ultimately while maintaining its rulers in titular power. Um, so I, I thought there were colonial precedents that could have been accessed that were perhaps uh, more akin to what happened to the Palestinians than Versailles. Although, of course, Said's sentiment was correct that, uh, uh, in the sense that Versailles was an attempt to fully humiliate uh, the Palestinians, right? Of course, uh, the nation liked that analogy of Versailles. They would repeat it several times. And I thought, of course, they had an ulterior motive because usually what Versailles always meant was that uh, uh, the, the humiliation of Versailles is what gave ammunition 
to the Nazis to right. rise. So the idea was that the, the, the nation editors were always concerned about the Palestinians becoming Nazi rather than about yeah. the continued colonization uh, by uh, Zionist settler colonialism of Palestinian land. So I was, I was always not you know, very positive about the use of the Versailles analogy. Interesting. Uh, so, shifting gears a little bit, but uh, why do you think the Palestinian Authority has been so enduring almost 30 years uh, since its inception? Uh, the recent protests against the PA in the wake of uh, the killing of Nizar Banat and uh, recent polls as well show that there is a profound rejection of the PA and its leader, Mahmoud Abbas, uh, in the West Bank. Uh, Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza view uh, the PA security thugs as spies, as collaborators. But at the same time, the Palestinian Authority persists in its role in collaborating with Israel and its security forces acting as Israel's foot soldiers. And um, both the PA and its, its ruling uh, party, Fatah, um, provide some kind of, or, or have some kind of base uh, amongst uh, some Palestinians in the West Bank. When you compare this to the village leagues, um, there is some kind of persistence to the PA that, that, is, that would be interesting to examine. Why do you think it has endured uh, so long? As I just mentioned, the village leagues had, a, you know, was countered by the presence of the PLO. And it was created in the late 70s, early 80s, before uh, the entrenchment of neoliberalism and the end of the Cold War. So the international context, the, the economic context within which it existed, uh, did not allow for its continuation in an easy fashion. And the presence of the PLO and its uh, strong international legitimacy at the time was a major obstacle that could not be overcome. Um, the creation of the PA in the 90s after the fall of the Soviet Union with the US uh, being the uh, sole superpower controlling the world uh, was a much easier transformation in terms of institutionalizing the interests um, of the PA. Remember, one of the important things that uh, uh, Oslo did was institutionalize the PA financially in the lives of the Palestinians. First of all, it de demobilized the Palestinian uh, revolution of the first Intifada by co-opting uh, many of its leaders into the PA political class or bureaucracy or the security apparatus. And uh, uh, it co-opted all the technicians and the intellectuals into the mushrooming non governmental organizations who had descended like the plague on the Palestinian territories, offering uh, uh, relatively very, very high uh, incomes uh, to uh, activists. Um, you know, the NGO whether, industrial complex. Absolutely, it is the NGO industrial complex. So uh, as a result, you've created a population under occupation uh, who is now fully dependent financially on income that comes to it from the peace process. The NGOs were created by the peace process. They were linked to it. The PA was created by the peace process. It was linked to it. The financial remuneration and financial aid that went into the PA coffers went into it uh, as long as there was a peace process that was unfolding and ongoing. And therefore, now you've uh, 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 attached the majority of the Palestinian population whose economic situation was dire uh, at the end of uh, uh, six years or five years of the first Intifada and the destruction of much of the Palestinian, especially agricultural economy, but much of the economy in general. Um, so this situation to rescue the Palestinians economically uh, through uh, employment by the PA and by the NGOs would link I think the Palestinians uh, structurally and economically to the PA and the peace process. As a result, anyone who wanted to oppose the PA uh, or to bring it down would lose their job and their livelihood. This way you linked the livelihoods of people to their oppression, to their national oppression and to the possibility of the continuation of their colonization by uh, Jewish settler colonists. One of the interesting things that uh, Oslo had done um, having 
come about uh, after the 1980s, after the fall of the Soviet Union, after the institutionalization and the expansion of neoliberalism, is the creation of a number of classes. Oslo created a number of classes uh, to uh, help institutionalize the PA as a permanent uh, 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 fixture. Uh, so there was, you, what, what you had is basically a, a political elite that was created or brought from, uh, the, uh, from, from exile to staff the Palestinian Authority, uh, but also uh, some of the political elites inside uh, the West Bank and Gaza were also added to those who arrived from uh, Tunisia. A second uh, group was the bureaucracy that was needed to administer the population for the PA, composed mostly of local staff, but also of returnees that also used to staff the different PLO departments. Um, a third segment was, of course, the security force, which uh, was used to repress Palestinian resistance to Israel and to Oslo, as it continues today, uh, composed of you know, former guerrillas turned mercenaries for Israel to be financed and trained by the Americans and the Europeans, um, employees of the non-governmental organizations, which, as I've mentioned, are most of the intellectual and technocratic class. They were all set up by the Americans and the Europeans, some by the Japanese. Um, mostly former activists and public intellectuals who participated in the first intifada would become uh, part of uh, 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 the new NGO staffs. And then of course you have the Palestinian business class, the local and the diaspora uh, uh, class who returned from exile to profit off their people and off the Oslo process. Um, and those sort of, uh, and, and the rich already in the West Bank and Gaza who had been already profiting under the occupation before Oslo would become a very important segment, which in fact, uh, uh, you know, re remember Palestinian millionaires pushed Arafat to sign Oslo, you know, even if he had any doubts, which I'm not sure he did, but they pushed him to accept the deal because of how much benefit they saw in it for Palestinian businesses. Uh, so in this sense, as the Oslo Accords were signed at the height of the hegemony of international neo neoliberal, uh, the international neoliberal order, um, the purpose, I think, of facilitating uh, profit making for Palestinian businessmen, uh, there was a number of programs to uh, uh, empower Palestinian women to become entrepreneurs, but they remain small. Uh, but also sort of the linking of the Palestinian intelligentsia to the NGOs, all of that was able to uh, ensure a relatively lean administrative staff inside the PA and an expansive security apparatus to repress uh, uh, resistance. Um, just to give you an example, a couple of years ago, amidst the preparations for the deal of the centuries, uh, Bahrain conference, which uh, uh, Gerald Kushner had presided over on the orders of Trump, um, uh, just you know, uh, uh, as they were preparing for the, for this conference in Bahrain, the Israeli Army Chief of General Staff, uh, General uh, Aviv Kochavi, had met with a prominent Palestinian millionaire uh, in Ramallah to discuss the current economic situation in the West Bank. So we're speaking here about direct meetings between Palestinian businessmen and the Israeli military brass, uh, not even the political brass, to discuss the economic situations and the profit-making operations that the Palestinian bourgeoisie uh, uh, has benefited and continues to benefit from. So in this sense, by the time Trump came and insisted that perhaps the PA's political class may no longer be necessary, all we need is the businessmen and the policemen, which is, of course, the same uh, structure for neoliberalism everywhere in the world. The idea of having a lean government, because you know the businessmen will be able to run things, and those who oppose them will be shot by the police. Hence, the militarization of the police force in the U.S. and in Europe, and uh, the carte blanche given to business elites to run the affairs of the economy uh, through a very friendly but lean uh, bureaucratic staff uh, uh, that opposes the. Idea of big government, as they call it in the US. So I think all of this sort of accounts for the persistence of the PA in these times, especially because Palestinian, the Palestinian situation and Jewish settler colonialism uh, has persisted beyond uh, even the last uh, 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 sort of uh, liberation struggle in Africa and Asia, which was, of course, the South African struggle that had made uh, a, a compromise that was also detrimental 
to the economic rights of Black South Africans in 1994. That deal that Mandela and the ANC concluded was one wherein they would trade off the granting of political rights to people of color, uh, uh, mostly Black people, but also Indians and coloreds in South Africa in exchange for uh, not getting any economic rights, right? The idea is that they would get, if, if they accepted political rights, but continued to allow economic white supremacy to prevail in South Africa, so apartheid would end. That was the deal that they took. And as we know, of course, today, uh, poverty and uh, uh, the racial divisions in terms of uh, income and uh, uh, property in South Africa are larger than they had been even under apartheid. Uh, nonetheless, that was the deal that was accepted by the AN. See, the Palestinians were not allowed even that kind of deal. Precisely at the time that the Bantustans were being uh, 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 destroyed and removed from the terrain of South Africa uh, in 1994, they were being created for the Palestinians through the mechanism of Oslo and the mechanism of the PLO or Arafat turned uh, Boutalesi uh, uh, in the Palestinian case. But I think the international context was uh, uh, very important in uh, uh, rendering the PA uh, longevity uh, sort of as a uh, uh, as, as it has been, uh, namely that uh, the, the age of revolutionary struggles of the 60s and 70s, uh, ha, and even uh, you know uh, the few in the 80s had ended. Uh, the bipolar world had ended. There was no longer an Eastern Bloc. Um, and at the same time, and, and so these were the reasons why the PLO in fact ceased to be the PLO and became a collaborating authority. And as a result, its ability to continue in that role was uh, enforced by uh, the economic help uh, uh, that the, the EU and the US mostly provide to ensure Palestinian uh, uh, obedience and, and uh, the end of Palestinian resistance. What would it take for the PA to be overthrown? And do you think it should be replaced before liberation or just done away with? I mean, it seems to me if there is no money, the PA would not be able to uh, survive. Uh, but we do know that money continues to go into the coffers, especially of the security apparatus. Now, the question is, would the PA political apparatus continue to function? Uh, Trump thought they were not necessary. Uh, at this point, uh, and of course, uh, uh, neither did Netanyahu. Biden seems to believe uh, that perhaps they might need them for a bit longer. Uh, they need the security apparatus for sure, but the political apparatus may prove counterproductive uh, um, in that sense, except for a very, very small uh, sort of uh, uh, stuff. They would rather just keep the bureaucracy to run the affair, everyday affairs of uh, people, mostly, you know, uh, like a transportation system, say the the the, the sewage system, uh, 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 water and electricity uh, services, things of that sort. But aside aside from this, they you know garbage collecting. Besides that, they really don't need a political staff of this size, uh, whose corruption has been legendary um, uh, in the last uh, uh, three decades, um, um, and therefore uh, you see this kind of weakness within the PA political leadership, which is. Uh, contrasted with the amazing strength and uh, hubris of the Palestinian security apparatus. For now, there has been no, uh, uh, I would say, threat coming from the security apparatus against the political apparatus, even though the security apparatus understands very well that it is the favorite of the Israelis and the Americans, and the political apparatus understands very well that they are not or no longer needed necessarily. Um, Palestinian uh, big business uh, remains uh, unclear on uh, this new project. I think uh, the, the big business the Palestinian businessmen and billionaires and millionaires feel that they do need the political apparatus for now, um, which is why I think it seems to be to continue to be maintained, although uh, there have been some uh, complaints recently about its performance. Um, and indeed, it's embarrassing uh, uh, repressive apparatus where uh, uh, had become sort of uh, you know, headlines in the international press. And they would rather a lot of this repression happen uh, sotto voce in a way, sort of in a way that is not so clearly uh, uh, embarrassing to them. 
So I think funding is the you know major criterion. If funding ends, it would end. And as we, as you saw, it almost did. It was rescued by Biden. And I think had Trump continued to be in power, it would not have survived for much longer. And and by by it here, I mean the political apparatus, not the uh, security bodies that have been set up and trained by the Americans. I mean. You, you described the embarrassing uh, repressive apparatus and how it was covered uh, in w Western media even uh, following the protests um, in reaction to Benat's uh, killing. And there was a sense that the PA's response uh, in its crackdown on protesters was hysterical. I mean, uh, there was a really a mask off moment. We understand the PA and uh, the purpose uh, for which it serves, but there was really this this really hysterical response uh, uh, on on protesters. Uh, you've sort of touched on this, but following the U.S. defeat uh, in Afghanistan, do you think that the Palestinian Authority has some kind of collapse anxiety uh, that its puppet government and you know it's not just its uh, political apparatus, but uh, the the entire uh, uh, apparatus will collapse as well? That anxiety has been there for some time, I think. Um, I mean, we, we begin to see this uh, uh, clearly uh, you know, with, with the failure of the PA to continue to pretend to be elected democratically in 2006. And with the end of all elections, I uh, remember the last time uh, Abbas was elected uh, or uh, the, his mandate, his electoral mandate ended in 2009. So as a result, he's been a sole dictator sort of uh, without any kind of mandate ruling uh, well, ruling is a strong word, but presiding over this collaborationist authority since 2009. Now, when I say these things were embarrassing, of course, I think they're embarrassing to American and uh, you know, to the American government and American liberals and to European governments and the EU. They're not embarrassing to the PA necessarily. Um, the PA repressive apparatus has been added since Arafat arrived in Gaza in 1994. They have killed Palestinians. They have put them in jail. They have tried to control elections. They have uh, uh, attacked and tortured uh, 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 dissidents. Uh, they've attacked universities and students. They've tried to fix elections. Um, they have collaborated with the Israelis in handing over uh, uh, Palestinians uh, to them. Um, they've uh, shot at Palestinians who resisted Israelis, put them in jail. They are they gloat often and, and boast of having uncovered all kinds of uh, resistance operations that they refer to as terrorists targeting the Israeli military of occupation or the illegal, illegal colonial settlers. So uh, None of this has caused them to feel uh, uh, scandalized or in any way embarrassed by uh, uh, these actions. The problem in the Banat assassination uh, was, of course, that it embarrassed their sponsors, not the Israelis, certainly, who you know were absolutely fine with this. And I, we, we did not hear much uh, uh, complaining uh, from their side. Uh, however, the Americans, I think, were uncomfortable and disturbed uh, and, and uh, you know, or annoyed, and, and so were the Europeans, which is quite odd because, of course, this is exactly why they funded and trained uh, these uh, secure, you know, security officers uh, to do, right? They, this is what they're there. Their raison d'etre is to repress any opposition to Oslo and to the PA and to the continued uh, settler colonization um, of the West Bank and Gaza. So it is uh, indeed odd. Now, um, uh, the anxiety persists, like I said, especially uh, when Trump came to power, they realized that, in fact, uh, uh, their days were numbered, uh, that uh, their effectiveness and their, their or their usefulness for the Israelis and for the Americans uh, was no longer uh, uh, paramount. Indeed, ever since uh, Netanyahu stopped wanting to have any negotiations with the PA, they realized that they were no longer of any use to the Israelis. The Israelis got all that they could get from the PA, everything that it had, basically, it no longer had much to offer. It surrendered all its cards very, very early on, and they were done with it. Um, the Americans needed 
uh, or think they need it. Uh, Trump clearly was much more reasonable in realizing that there was no need for this apparatus. You know, we, we know what this game is. You know, we want, you know, the, basically the, the Jewish settler colonialism to continue. We don't want the opposition to it. So we need police to repress them. But we also need uh, businesses that support uh, uh, American capital to profit from this operation. Hence, his deal was about having businessmen and policemen run uh, 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 the lives of Palestinians under the umbrella of the Israeli military occupation and the rule, the arbitrary uh, rule of uh, Jewish colonial settlers. Um, so yes, the anxiety continues, I think, because they, they realize that um, they've outgrown their usefulness. And objectively, they have very little more to offer, really, uh, uh, as a political apparatus. Uh, the escape last week of six Palestinian men from one of Israel's most fortified prisons uh, has fueled fears that the fears that those six men, if they were to cross into the occupied West Bank, they would need to face a second enemy after the Israeli occupation forces, which is, of course, the PA police forces that you've described. Um, four of the escapees have been captured by the Israelis, but the remaining two could I mean, there's been speculation in the Israeli press about where, they, where they've got to, and there's a lot of disinformation going around, I suppose. But some of them have said that at least one of them is suspected to have escaped to his hometown, uh, Janin, in the north of the West Bank. If, in fact, they do turn up in the West Bank, do you think that will create problems for the Palestinian Authority in terms of it uh, increasingly open rebellion in the West Bank against them? Um, it would, because, of course, the PA security would arrest them and hand them over to the Israelis. Um, they might try to broker a deal wherein um, uh, the Israelis should not reveal that the PA security uh, had helped them uh, in recapturing them, or that they would rather, if they did capture them and the uh, uh, Palestinian POWs, or perhaps more precisely hostages, um, uh, realize that they were captured by the PA security officers, they might, would, they might ask the Israelis to shoot them dead before they speak to their lawyers so that they would not reveal that they had been captured by them. Remember, we, we are dealing with thugs. I mean, these people were actually trained by an American general as thugs. I have in mind, of course, Keith Dayton, who trained them to be a thuggish security apparatus, um, uh, to be criminal um, and, uh, you know, uh, collaborators with the enemy of their people, right? So, uh, and their mission is described by Abbas as a sacred mission of coordinating uh, their security efforts with the Israelis. So I think you're right. If, if they do capture them and it is revealed that they had captured them, this would uh, galvanize and mobilize more and more rebellions and revolutionary action against uh, the PA, which would lead to more and more repression, of course. Um, so, uh, so, so I think they would do their best uh, to uh, make sure the news doesn't go out uh, if, if they happen to capture them. Um, remember, I mean, there's, there's a bit of a, it's not a, a symmetrical uh, precedent, but the story of the PFLP leader, Ahmed Sadat. I was just thinking of that, yeah. Who back in 2002, if you recall, the Israelis had accused of um, uh, masterminding uh, the assassination of an Israeli minister. Uh, the PA was embarrassed in not handing him over. They brokered a deal. I think the Jericho deal with the British and the Americans uh, to try him and jail him in PA jails. The PA jail, of course, as, as the Palestinians uh, uh, or the PA uh, is treated like, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the racial inferiors and as children by the Americans and the Brits. Uh, UK and uh, American uh, observers monitored the, the PA prisons to make sure that Sadat remained in prison. This situation remained in operation until 2006 after the elections of Hamas. Hamas had, of course, uh, uh, pledged to release Sadat once it came to power. However, before that happened, the UK and the US uh, monitors of the jail decided to leave the jail, claiming the situation was no longer stable, allowing the Israelis to invade and abduct Sadat from the PA jail. Clearly, he was handed over uh, by uh, uh, their PA friends um, and uh, taken to an Israeli jail uh, where he remains a hostage today. Uh, he was 
uh, uh, held in solitary confinement till 2012, uh, tried and sentenced by an Israeli kangaroo court for 30 years in prison, and remains today you know, a, a hostage uh, and a POW um, in Israeli jails. But um, uh, you know, we'd never heard uh, um, after the elections ended and after the American engineered coup uh, overthrew Hamas in the West Bank, but not in Gaza. Uh, there's never been a request uh, uh, or any real effort to bring Sadat back to uh, uh, serve his time in a PA uh, prison. Um, so there's been already collaboration you know, uh, with the Israelis uh, on handing over or allowing the Israelis to take uh, possession of Palestinian, uh, Palestinian hostages uh, who are even leaders of the Palestinian liberation movement, or older leaders rather than the young, uh, some of the young uh, uh, prisoners that have now been in jail for uh, some four decades and, uh, uh, and who had not necessarily been part of the uh, PLO uh, structure. Uh, uh, as such, or high, or high ranking in that sense. So yes, there's been a precedent uh, of of the sort, and uh, um, I suspect the uh, PA security would be just as harsh as the Israeli uh, uh, army if they were to capture uh, uh, the Palestinian uh, hostages that escaped. Um. So. The Palestinian Authority has also been in the news lately because 14 of its security members were charged in the uh, killing of uh, uh, Nizar Banat. Um, and this largely appears to be a scapegoat trial. It kind of reminded me of the Khashoggi. I'm not sure if that's an appropriate analogy, but it reminded me of the, um, the Khashoggi scandal because it what, what's what seems to me is happening here is that this is um, uh, an attempt by the PA to portray the killing of Banat as an isolated incident committed by a number of undisciplined members of its security forces uh, rather than kind of the PA's MO. So the trial was uh, reportedly delayed on Tuesday after uh, their defense lawyer refused to show up or uh, failed to show up. What do you think of this trial and do you think it has any kind of greater significance than an attempt to whitewash the PA's legitimacy after it was tarnished by this by the scandal? It, it is precisely a whitewashing, but it's a whitewashing that they're pressured to do by the Americans and by the EU. It's not even uh, necessarily uh, on their own initiative. EU funders and American uh, Democrats uh, want to pretend that they are supporting uh, uh, you know, a, a, an authority that has uh, some rule of law, um, and therefore they need this show trial as Trump tried to uh, convince Saudi Arabia to have some form of a trial and arrests for the alleged uh, 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 criminals who killed Khashoggi, uh, uh, sort of to continue with your uh, uh, comparison. So I think, yes, um, it is a whitewash, but it is a whitewash at the initiative of the EU and the Americans who need it to be able to save face with the continuing funding and support that they give the PA in uh, to, to continue to repress and jail Palestinians who resist uh, the Israeli occupation, Jewish settler colonialism, and uh, the collaboration with both. So uh, I'm, I'm not holding a, a sort of... A, a, uh, any high hopes for uh, uh, you know justice to be rendered in the case of Benat anytime soon? Well, uh, thank you very much again for your time today, Joseph. We really appreciate it. It's been a really fascinating discussion, uh, exploration of all these different issues, and hopefully, you know, our viewers and listeners will have benefited from it too, and will have learned a, a lot more about the true nature of the Palestinian Authority. Thank you. Thank yeah. you very much for hosting me. Thank you very much. And we'll certainly link uh, to your biweekly column uh, so readers uh, can be directed to that. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks so very much. Bye bye. Thanks for watching this video. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hit like, leave a comment, 
these engagements help us with the YouTube algorithm and it helps us to get around Silicon Valley censorship as much as possible. It does make a difference. You can also support our journalism by going to electronicintifada.net and clicking on donate now. Thank you.